Hi, this is Tim Weber from South Texas College coming to you with another video. In this case, we're going to be looking at the period of development from conception to birth. And so in this chapter, then objectives are going to include describing development from conception through birth, analyzing the impact of genetic and environmental factors on this stage of development, and describing conditions that have positive and negative effects on prenatal development. So let's start out with genetics, the basis of all that goes on throughout this period. Um, first of all, our genetic material is found in each cell of our body, uh, the nucleus containing DNA. This is a large protein molecule. Uh, there are 26 chromosomes, 26 pairs of chromosomes uh, that contain this DNA in humans. And specific areas found on these chromosomes, such as you see in the diagram here, then are referred to as genes, specific areas on that chromosome. Uh, as I mentioned, these chromosomes come in pairs. And so we also have, you might say, a matching pair of genes on each of these uh, chrom chromosome pairs. So each gene has its match, although there can be variations of that gene found there. Variations of a gene then are referred to as its alleles. So in humans, then, we also have specialized cells referred to as gametes. These are the reproductive cells in males, the sperm, in females, the ovum. These gametes then have, rather than 23 pairs of chromosomes, 23 separate chromosomes. So we inherit then half of our chromosomes from our mother and half of them from our father. The 23rd pair of chromosomes determines the biological sex of the zygote that is produced. The zygote is the one cell, uh, first cell that is formed when the sperm and ovum unite. The 23rd pair of chromosomes then determines the biological sex. If we inherit an X chromosome from our mother, and an X chromosome from our father, then the biological sex will be female. If we inherit a Y chromosome from our father and an X chromosome from our mother, which is the only thing we can get from her, then uh, we end up with uh, biologically a male. The sum total of the genetic material that a person has is known as their genotype. So what is contained within their set of DNA? Their phenotype is their appearance. So appearance are what we can observe uh, in watching them, looking at them, studying their physical structure. So that's what we can see, phenotype. The human genome includes a great deal of diversity, and that may be important for the survival of our species. The genome then is the full set of genetic material that a person has. Any two humans, we're going to find that 99.5% of their genetic material is the same from one person to another. So by far, we have great, uh, greater similarity with all other humans than we do difference. That said, that one half percent that can differ from one person to another does account for some noticeable differences. When we look at the genetic similarities and differences amongst relatives, this illustrates that. Um, when it comes to siblings, brothers and sisters, we're going to find each of them gets 
half of their genetic material from each parent. Now, in fact, though, each parent can produce 8 million, roughly 8 million combinations of chromosomes just from their own genetic material. So already there we have potential for considerable variability. So on average, when it comes to the DNA that differs from one person to another, the genes that differ from one person to another, the average brother or sister has 50% the same, 50% uh, on average different from any brother or sister on average. So this accounts for why right, brothers and sisters are similar yet different. Now, when we look at twins, this can uh, be different. Monozygotic twins or identical twins have identical genetic material. They're actually formed as one zygote uh, with the same genetic material splits apart very early in development and becomes two individuals with the same genotype. Then variations in their appearance and behavior then are primarily due to environmental factors, them having identical genetic material. On the other hand, dizygotic twins or fraternal twins are formed when two separate ova, ova are fertilized by two separate sperm. So here we have distinctly different genetic uh, individuals. In fact, having half of the genes that can differ from one person in another uh, in common on average to the other. So really no more similar or different than uh, any other yeah. brothers or sisters. So next let's have a look at various types of genetic traits. Some genetic traits are polygenic. Now you can probably figure this one out. The word poly means many and genic and for genes. So these are traits where more than one gene is involved in producing that trait. So there's a lot of things that fit this category. People's height, personality, intelligence, Lots of different things fit this category. Some traits are multifactorial. What that means is the way that the uh, gene involved is expressed is influenced by environmental factors. A good example would be uh, skin color. So um, many of us find that if we don't go out in the sun much, our skin will be considerably lighter than if we get out in the sun frequently. I know that's the case for me. And so notice that that outside factor of sun exposure is influencing how the genes involved with producing our skin color are actually behaving. Or another uh, extreme example might be uh, genes that have to do with height. So we might have a person who has the genetic potential to be six foot two, but they might not reach that height. Why? Possibly genetic factors like malnutrition or a lot of childhood illness might again influence how those genes are expressed. So multifactorial influence by environmental factors of various types. Now, when it comes to other um, bits of our DNA. Some of that DNA, they thought at one time didn't have any real function. Uh, they didn't know what it did. And so they even called it junk DNA for a while. They thought it was just left over from some evolutionary process or something like that. But then they found out that actually, no, this DNA that they didn't know what was doing, uh, turned out to be regulating other genes and so became known as regulator DNA. So this 
this genetic material regulates when a particular gene switches on and it switches off. Some genetic traits are additive. And so various forms of that gene, the influence of these uh, is added together to produce the ultimate result. And so mm, good examples would be, well, uh, hair curliness, the gene involved with that, uh, one form of the gene produces curly hair uh, if the person has both in their, this pair of genes uh, coding for curliness. Uh, another form of the gene codes for straight hair. And of course, if both of your copies of that gene are for straight hair, you'll have straight hair. Well, what if you get uh, one gene for curly and one gene for straight hair, then what? Well, then you get somewhere in between what some people call wavy hair. So the effects of those two different genes is sort of added together to produce the result or averaged out. And genes for height to a great extent work that way too. So if you have two tall parents, uh, your light, their offspring is also likely to be on the taller end of the spectrum. If they're both short, their offspring is more likely to be on the short side of the spectrum. Now that said, because there are many genes involved with height, uh, in some cases, even a short parent might have a few height genes in there. And if the, as the dice is rolled in reproduction, they happen to get those uh, predominantly that are for a little bit more height, you might actually have uh, the offspring of short parents being somewhat taller than they are. Uh, and there's another factor as well. Don't forget that height is multifactorial. And some people say, I know, you know, a whole family, they've all been short up until this last generation, and all the kids are taller than their parents and their grandparents and aunts and uncles. Well, don't forget that nutrition has to do with that and childhood health. So as uh, health and nutrition is more available, we might find, yeah, uh, people developing more of their height potential, uh, even though genetically they may have no more potential, uh, the environment enables them to develop more of their potential. Now, in contrast to additive genetic traits, there are also what we call dominant and recessive uh, genetic traits. Sometimes these are referred to as non-additive traits. And so in the case of these, the um, varying forms of the gene have varying forms of influence. And here, let's go to our, let's see if we can go to our uh, whiteboard, as I call it. Okay. And let's see if we can do some illustration of this. Okay. So we're going to take um, the example of sickle cell anemia, okay? So sickle cell anemia is a disorder where red, red blood cells do not form correctly and therefore circulatory problems, which can be very dangerous, can occur. Now, it is of this non-additive pattern. So one form of the gene involved which we're going to write with a capital letter, the dominant form. If the person has this form of the gene, they will have normal red blood cell formation. Just put RVC for red blood cell, okay? All right, so this dominant form codes for normal red blood cells. Now, the recessive form, the less influential form generally, we'll write that with a small letter, is going to vary depending upon the situation, okay? So, if the person has both of these, genes as the dominant form, normal red blood cells. If the person has one dominant gene of this pair, 
again, normal red blood cells. And oh, by the way, it could be this way, okay, just getting from the other parent. So how does one end up with sickle cell anemia, the actual disease? They must inherit both of these genes in this pair being the recessive Oops. in this case abnormal red blood cells form. Okay. All right. Now we also have the situation then mm, should mention yeah that some people can be carriers of this recessive sickle cell gene. So what's that mean? Well, here they are. They have the dominant form, which codes for normal blood cells, and they have one of the recessive form. In this case, the person has normal red blood cells. Now here's the really interesting thing. The fact that they have one copy of this recessive gene also means malaria resistance. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, just to make that a bit more interesting, this recessive form of the gene here is more common in people of African ancestry. Well, that kind of makes sense, it means that having one of these can give you malaria resistance. Uh, in many areas of Africa, uh, malaria has been a very big problem, and this would be then beneficial uh, for the survival of populations in those areas. Okay, um, let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Oh, yeah, uh, so carriers then they have recessive gene, only one in their genotype. But not evident in their phenotype. Okay. So the person having that uh, recessive gene, we can't tell by looking at them or observing their behavior that they have it. Now, it might be also worthwhile having a look at the potential of inheriting uh, these uh, dominant and recessive genes as well. Okay, so how does a person actually end up getting sickle cell anemia? Well, in order for that to happen, both parents must be carriers of the gene, um, recessive gene okay uh, or must be sickle cell recipients but notice they can also get it if they have both parents as carriers so here's one parent one dominant gene one sickle cell gene here's another with dominant gene and then sickle cell gene so notice that the offspring getting these two genes normal Okay, this one, they're a carrier, but in terms of their red blood cells, normal. Let's see, what about here? They get the normal form, the dominant form, recessive form. These are also carriers. This person also is a carrier. And what about here? In this case, both forms of the gene are recessive and they actually develop the genes. So what are the odds if both parents are carriers that an offspring is going to have the disease? Off, odds 25% or one in four, okay? Um, so we can also you know, look at what if you have one parent that has both dominant genes and one parent is a carrier, 
in that case, you've got uh, each offspring 50, uh, 50, 50 per, uh, percent chance of receiving that sickle cell gene. So a little complicated, but might explain a few things that might have been kind of perplexing to you in the past. Okay, so let's move to Ben's other, let me go back to where we here. Go back to this, yeah, okay. All right, so when we hear about heritability studies, what this is picking up on is what percentage of variation for some given trait can be traced to genes in a specific population? Now, our discussion here wouldn't be complete without looking at also epigenetic mechanisms. And so these are mechanisms that produce a, a change in outcomes potentially but not through inheriting different genes, but rather by having a mechanism that acts on existing genes. So epigenetic mechanisms then uh, involve the formation or removal of these methyl groups to DNA. And the end result of that methyl group attaching to uh, DNA uh, to a particular gene is to silence that gene to um, to shut it down. Okay, so some of these epigenetic mechanisms are just part of normal development, either in the womb, in utero, or during childhood. These also, though, can occur through exposure to environmental chemicals, drugs, pharmaceuticals, can occur as part of the aging process, or due to diet. And I think maybe we ought to add one more here, and that is can also be due to exposure to various infectious agents. It's one that I'm thinking of because we're in the middle of that COVID-19 pandemic, and God knows what that virus might do if it produces uh, some of this process uh, and maybe affecting people's genetic expression for long times after they're even uh, rid of that virus. But anyways, okay, so what happens? Methyl group attacks here, uh, silences that gene. Here are some potential uh, outcomes depending upon what genes are affected. Uh, can uh, result in cancer, autoimmune diseases where the body is attacking its own tissues, uh, such as lupus or such as uh, certain types of arthritis, uh, where the body is actually attacking its own joints. Um, mental disorders, such as depression, even if people don't have a genetic predisposition to depression, uh, this may alter how they process various neurotransmitters. Diabetes as well. Hmm, interesting. Yeah particularly type 2 diabetes. And so lifestyle factors like exercise and diets, inf that influences how our genes actually express themselves, whether they do so properly. Now, these methyl groups, once attached to DNA, are pretty sticky. And so, <laughs> yeah, uh, when these attach, it may be a lifelong thing, Although the other thing is, it has been found that it is possible uh, to um, uh, reverse the process in some cases. And I suspect that's what's going on in type two diabetes when people change their diet and exercise and they, uh, there seems to be a remission of that type two diabetes going on. Uh, but at any rate, the other interesting thing that has been identified first in animal research, is that methylated genes can be passed on to the next generation. So you might inherit um, a healthy gene from a parent, but if it is methylated in this way, uh, then it could potentially be problematic. Uh, the first one that they identified uh, in mice, they found that 
mice could pass on a methylated gene that caused them to be more prone to stress and anxiety and depression, uh, rat depression, than normal. And they're actually able to pass this on to their offspring. And subsequently, they found this is possible in humans, although they don't know which uh, forms of this uh, exactly. So uh, it is possible that grandma's experience could have an impact on how your genes express themselves. By the way, you won't see much about this in the textbook. Even biology classes, I find often they're not talking about this very much, but it is indeed very significant. Okay, so let's move on to then specifically what developments occur during the prenatal period and the birth process as well. So in the way we're going to look at it, we're going to divide the prenatal period into three periods, the germinal period, the embryonic period, and the fetal period. Okay, so notice that these are not trimesters. Trimesters are simply three-month uh, groupings, and trimesters, while they can be useful, don't really fit the pattern how development actually occurs. So this is more consistent with specific developments. Okay, so the germinal period is the first two weeks after conception, after we have that zygote, that first cell being formed, which is going to have all the genetic material that that person uh, will have for life. And so during this time, the first cell begins to divide, to duplicate, and shortly thereafter, there is a differentiation process that goes on. And so different kinds of cells begin to form. The first of these differences are uh, some of these cells being formed become the actual embryo, while others become the placenta, the supporting tissues. Eventually, there are specific uh, neurons, uh, skin tissue, bone, you name it, okay, uh, as time goes on. So if things go well during this time period, then the zygote travels down the fallopian tube and implants, attaches to the wall of the uterus where it can then draw nutrition from the mother. However, 50 to 70% of zygotes that are formed fail to implant, and so they simply degenerate. And so uh, what is surprising to a lot of people is that in fact, 50 to 70% of conceptions already uh, terminate uh, shortly after, okay? So uh, often the woman doesn't even know that a conception has occurred. Now, during this two-week period, germinal period, that first cell, uh, if it survives, then multiplies into hundreds of cells. So next, let's look at the embryonic period. This is the third to eighth week of, of the prenatal period. And during this time, many systems and features begin to develop. And we're going to see that many of these, it is a critical period. They must begin developing. At this point, if something interferes with their development, there will be a permanent, um, a permanent deficit as a result. So around three weeks, we see the beginnings of a primitive nervous system in the form of what they call a neural tube, where later on the uh, brain and the spinal cord will begin developing. By four weeks, you see the beginnings of a heart and a face appearing. Uh, by five weeks, you have buds appearing where arms and legs will grow. And by six weeks, those have grown out and hands and feet also begin to form. By seven weeks, you have the beginnings of the eyes, nose, fingers, toes, and primitive digestive system. 
and by eight weeks you have the beginnings of all the basic organs and basic features of a human with the exception of the sex organs sex organs and in that case where those sex organs will eventually develop there is a patch of tissue that you can't tell whether it's male or female so it's called an indifferent gonad what a weird term right um, that's the one thing that you can't yet tell. By the end of that eighth week also then, you have an embryo that is about an inch long, weighs about a gram, and also uh, exhibits uh, on average 150 movements per hour. So there's a lot more going on than people might recognize already at this time. Now having said that, 20% 20, uh, 20 of those zygotes that enter this embryonic period also miscarry during this, uh, this embryonic period. And you can see some various uh, forms of the embryo here up above in the pictures as well as in the textbook. So then the fetal period, is the longest period beginning with the third month of pregnancy. And here now you're going to finally have sexual differentiation. And so in the male fetus, there is a gene on the Y chromosome called the SRY gene that activates at this time. This causes a release of testosterone that causes male genitals to develop, as well as uh, the male version of brain organization, slightly different than what we will find in females. So if this does not occur, uh, then you have female genital development, female brain organization. By the end of the third month, then you have all of the body parts visible and you have a fetus that now weighs about three ounces and about three inches in length. Not yet viable though, and what we mean by that, not able to yet survive on its own. And we might see something like this early in that fetal period, although as time goes on, they're gonna look more like a newborn baby as time goes on. Um, the fetal period, then the middle three months, the fetus is primarily pre uh, preparing for survival. So each of those systems becomes more fully developed, the circulatory system, the digestive system, nervous system, and so on, particularly the nervous system. In the nervous system, we have very rapid neurogenesis. This is what? The formation, creation of new neurons. So those neurons are multiplying rapidly. And we also have rapid paced synaptogenesis. This is the rapid formation of connections between those neurons. So the nervous system is being created and it's wiring itself up already. Now it's not gonna be fully wired up even when the baby's born, but it is already beginning to do so. And during this middle three months, then the brain will quadruple in size. The fetus also becomes more responsive to outside stimuli. And you might ask, well, what sort of stimuli can the fetus respond to? Uh, the fetus can respond to sounds. Those uh, vibrations of sounds can readily reach them within the womb. They can respond to the mother's emotional state. Uh, if mom is stressed, you will see stress also on the part of the fetus. Uh, you also will find they can respond to physical damage, uh, what we might think of as a pain response. Okay, so uh, it appears that, yes, uh, the fetus can actually experience pain. So some moms will also say their fetus maybe could respond to the foods they ate, uh, things like that. Uh, sometimes if they eat certain foods, the fetus seems to be disturbed by that and so on. So a lot of responsiveness, again, showing that that nervous system is actually beginning to boot up and become functional. So 
the age of viability would be the age of a fetus that potentially they might survive outside the womb. So right now, the lower limit of this seems to be around 22 weeks if we have advanced medical technology available. Now that doesn't mean all fetuses at this point can survive. It depends upon the extent of their brain maturation, their weight, uh, their respiratory system and cardiovascular system development. And just like people hit their teenage growth spurt at slightly different times, fetuses have you know, slightly different timetables uh, for their maturation as well. So one might survive at that point, whereas another doesn't. Now, if there is not advanced medical technology available, then the age that the fetus can survive is going to be considerably later. Preterm infants that are born near this age of viability uh, time period uh, may survive and also are at greater risk for um, many complications later on and some of that. So as we get towards the end of that fetal period, by 28 weeks, a few weeks later, uh, we now see a wake and sleep cycle exhibited by the fetus. And that may or may not match mom's wake and sleep cycle. Some of them will tell us. And by 28 weeks, you now have a 95% survival rate uh, if they are uh, born at that point. So much improved odds of survival just in a few weeks. Last three months then, the fetus gains size and weight. The average birth weight of uh, first babies is seven and a half pounds. And each of the systems of the body continues to mature. Cerebral cortex, the outer layer of the brain, actually folds so that it can fit within the, uh, the brain uh, the cranium. And fetuses exhibit increased awareness of their environment as well. So a little bit about birth weight and term. I've used some abbreviations here, so you might have to listen carefully to catch those. So low birth weight, I've just abbreviated LBW, low birth weight, babies that weigh less than five and a half pounds. Very low birth weight, three pounds, five ounces to that five and a half pound. Uh, and then extremely low birth weight, you've got two pounds, three ounces up to that three point five ounce. Okay. So this is simply looking at the baby's weight. Now, we also have babies that are born preterm. Preterm means they're born before 35 weeks of gestation, before 35 weeks of development. A third category of babies would be small for gestational age. So these babies are smaller than you would expect for the number of weeks of development. So you can have a baby that is full term, small for gestational age, smaller than you would expect a full term baby. Or you can have one born at say 30 weeks and still small for gestational age, smaller than you would even expect at 30 weeks. Now, all of these are cause for concern. Uh, various types of complications and hazards uh, exist for babies of low birth weight, those that are preterm, and those that are small for gestational age. Of all of these, um, other than maybe extremely low birth weight, small for gestational age is a particular concern. Why? more of a concern than if the baby's just a few weeks preterm. The reason being small for gestational age indicates that there is something that has interfered with normal development um, somewhere before that point in time. So that's uh, often a red flag when that occurs. So what contributes to birth weight, preterm births, uh, small for gestational age? Uh, causes are very similar to all of these. One would, could be genetic factors, also maternal illness as well. 
um, an infection or exhaustion or malnutrition on the part of the mother. Now, you might not see that so much here in the US. Uh, however, in other parts of the world where women may have to uh, work very physically demanding jobs while they're still um, pregnant and uh, maybe where adequate nutrition is not available, then you would tend to see more of that. Uh, also, maternal drug use, um, as well as multiple births tend to produce these effects. So the birth process uh, begins when the baby is um, mature enough, uh, the lung, lungs developed enough, then it signals to the mother that it's ready. There's some interesting research that came out recently on that. And so the mother then uh, begins to release oxytocin that stimulates the contractions of the uterus. The average labor uh, is around 38 weeks. And for a woman's first child, uh, on average is 12 hours. The birthing positions that are used can vary greatly. Into detail there, but you can look into that. It seems that the preferences um, have more to do with one's cultural background or per personal preferences uh, than really the effectiveness of them. So the events of an uncomplicated birth go as follows. So uh, the contractions begin, the baby turns in such a way that the head is oriented towards that birth canal, the cervix, the opening to the birth canal dilates, relaxes so that the contractions can push the head through that birth uh, canal. The head emerges first, the body follows, and then finally the placenta, the supporting structures, our uh, tissues are delivered as well. So that is uh, your basic uncomplicated birth. Now, while we're here, you might just want to mention a couple of uh, the more common birth complications. One is uh, fetal distress that is caused by a lack of oxygen, anoxia, uh, A-N-O-X-I-A. Uh, this may occur when, for example, the umbilical cord uh, wraps around the uh, neck during the birth process. Fortunately, fetal monitors today can detect uh, this as it's occurring, and doctors can take um, quick steps to alleviate the problem. One of the other uh, birth complications that is fairly common is a breech birth, and that is when the baby is not oriented uh, properly and uh, maybe even feet first, which makes it very difficult to deliver the baby. Now, one of the things that has increased the survival rates of babies significantly is the development of the APGAR scale. The APGAR scale, you might think, oh, some kind of equipment. No, it's actually a procedure that is performed uh, a minute before, minute after the baby's born and five minutes later, they rate the baby on five different, uh, different categories. And let's go to our uh, whiteboard again for that one. There we have it. Okay. So the five categories are appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. So they will rate the baby from zero to two on each of these. Appearance is, you know, their color. Are they uh, nice and you know, pink that their circulation is good. Are they blue, like they don't are not getting enough oxygen, or in between? Uh, pulse obviously is their pulse strong and regular, or is it rapid, or is it lacking? No pulse. Uh, grimace. So uh, they uh, stimulate an area of the baby's body, like their foot. And normally you would make a face, that's what a grimace is, and so they're looking for a response. 
So this is looking to see is the nervous system and reflexes uh, working as it should. Activity is the baby showing muscular movements uh, such that again, so is their muscular nervous system circulation is good uh, or is they, are they lacking movement or just limp? And then finally respiration, uh, normal breathing or rapid or lacking, uh, all of that. Okay, so here's the thing, is as they then rate the baby on this, this enables them to provide the proper care for that baby. Uh, if they uh, find that the baby rates seven and up, they're doing fine and no special uh, intervention is needed. On the other hand, uh, if they find that it is between uh, four and seven, then there is, they're having some difficulty and some assistance uh, is needed. Uh, if it is below four, this is a critical situation and immediate, uh, very serious intervention is needed. So this then has uh, had the effect of enabling the medical personnel to provide the um, needed care and prevent many needless deaths of babies. So let's have a little bit of a look in terms of medical intervention in the birth process. And first of all, realize that infant mortality, uh, the death of infants, uh, babies has decreased due to medical, better medical care here in the US. Now having said that, uh, the US rates only 41st out of 193 nations that keep track of this stuff. So we're not doing the best in the world, no matter what Mr. Trump says. Uh, we still have room for improvement, even when it comes to infant mortality. Now, consider though, in 1900, 5% of babies died uh, at birth. Okay, that's one in 20. Today, it's down to what? Half of what? Half of a percent. Okay, half a percent. So, tremendous improvement, even if we are not doing the best in the world. That's good news. Now, on the other hand, maternal death rate, the mother dying in childbirth. Highest rates of this are found in the poorest nations in the world, where one in 20 women die during childbirth. So nations having over 5% maternal death rate, places like Afghanistan, Somalia, generally places where there's a great deal of poverty as well as uh, just lawlessness and um, lack of medical care available. Now, that said, Excessive medical care can actually be problematic as well. So we've had an increase in elective C-sections. So these are uh, cesarean births that are not required. And turns out that this uh, is associated with a higher rate of low birth weight babies. So when elective C-sections are done, there is a greater chance that you're going to have a low birth weight baby than if you allow that baby to go full term and a normal uh, birth. So speaking of cesarean sections, a sur surgical birth, this indeed can be a lifesaver in emergencies. The fetus can be removed quickly. Uh, that said, the rates of this and reasons for it vary greatly. In poorer countries, this is reserved simply for emergencies. However, in wealthier countries like the US, um, this may be done actually for the convenience of the mother or obstetrician uh, so that they can maybe even fit it into their schedule where they desire rather than when the baby uh, says that it's ready. So in fact, this has reached now one third of births in the United States. And I should mention that I think Mexico was in like within 1% of where we were when it came to cesarean sections as well. So quite uh, common there as well. 
So with cesarean section, you do have less trauma for the newborn, but slower recovery for the mother because it is a major surgery. Um, there is also some um, data that suggests that, in fact, uh, babies who go through the normal birth process uh, will tend to be hardier and more resilient than those born through cesarean section. But we're looking at um, correlational research there, so we're not sure if that's cause and effect, but suggest it might be actually contributing, a normal birth contribute to some resiliency. So there are things then regarding medical intervention that have made birth uh, safer or less painless. Uh, but even these things also have their risks as well that we should be aware of. So epidurals. Epidurals are shots that um, uh, relieve pain injected into the um, spinal cord. And the benefit, of course, uh, birth is much less painful. However, the risk is that this also will weaken contractions. And so it may make it necessary in some cases that the baby be delivered by cesarean section rather than uh, normal birth. Induced labor is another uh, thing that can be very beneficial uh, if the baby has gone well beyond the normal range of uh, gestational period and becoming so large that they're going to be very difficult to deliver, then inducing labor is very beneficial. However, if this is done uh, early on, um, if this is done simply to have the baby at a certain point in time, in fact, that baby may not be uh, fully developed uh, if it is closer to the normal weeks of gestation. And so, in fact, may result in some low birth weight babies or preterm. Uh, so, like many things, they have benefits as well as risks. Now, um, where are most people born today? Mostly in hospitals, at least here in the US. 100 years ago, though, where were most people born? They were born at home with the aid of midwives. And so consider how these two settings differs. Uh, today's hospital, very sterile. Uh, that's a good thing, right? Um, on the other hand, that hospital can be quite impersonal. And so there may be many people uh, circulating, uh, unfamiliar people. Uh, unfamiliar equipment and procedures being done. Um, sometimes family members may not be fully able to be present uh, as well in that hospital setting or not all of them that are desired. In contrast, 100 years ago, the home birth, uh, you had familiar setting, uh, familiar people that you trust there with you, and supportive relatives, as many as you want or could tolerate. Uh, so notice it's a very different setting. And so some people today are saying they want um, that experience of birth to be more like that home birth setting. And so in fact, uh, some women are choosing to give birth at home uh, also, there have been the development of birthing centers, and these are um, facilities uh, away from a hospital, uh, which are made to be more home-like in that uh, uh, other people can be there and so forth. And uh, without all of the trappings of the medical uh, setting, now, these birthing centers also are set up so if some complication does occur, if it's something that can't be handled there, that the woman can be rapidly transferred uh, to a hospital where that can be taken care of. So they seem to be relatively safe. In fact, home births 
with a uh, qualified, uh, certified midwife also relatively safe. So not a whole lot of difference in uh, safety of home births under those circumstances to hospital births. Uh, oh, by the way, should mention just something to think about though in terms of home birth. Sometimes uh, women might desire to have a home birth, but in some cases it might be better to opt with hospital birth if uh, they are in a high risk pregnancy, high risk of complications occurring at the time of birth. They might want to consider simply planning to have that child at the hospital rather than trying for the home birth. Just a thought. Okay, in any setting, what we've learned is the presence of support of others benefits tremendously. Support of father, relatives, friends, or doula. And I had to look for that one. That's not that familiar to many of us, although uh, some people said this is, uh, has become more common in Mexico. Uh, doula is um, sort of like a uh, pregnancy and birth coach. So. Uh, they work with the woman throughout the pregnancy, uh, doing various exercises and preparing them for the birth. And then they're there uh, during the birth process. And then they help the uh, woman also adjust to uh, beginning to care for the child, breastfeeding and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting concept that we don't see a lot here. Something that maybe we ought to consider developing uh, seems like this could be very beneficial. But at any rate, uh, presence of support of others is very important. And the contrast to that, uh, almost no one wants to give birth alone. If you want to look at the other side of that. Okay. So in the next uh, segment, then we'll take up uh, the newborn and their characteristics. So let's end this one right here and have a great day and come back for more later on.